everyone! In this video we're talking about the theme of cell compartmentalization in AP Biology. The basic idea behind this video is that cells have membranes or special spaces that allow them to establish and maintain environments that are different from their external environments in order for certain cellular processes and reactions to occur. So overall, cells are comprised of different defined compartments. In eukaryotic cells, we know these as organelles. Each compartment has a specific function, and generally it is a eukaryotic feature, but there is some compartmentalization in prokaryotic cells as well, and scientists have found these in protein-bounded areas and lipid-bounded areas within prokaryotic organisms. But as we know, eukaryotic cells have well-defined compartments. Each part has a specialty for a particular function, and a lot of times when we focus on different processes within the cell, we focus on where they occur, whether that is within the plasma membrane, within the cytosol, or within membrane-bound organelles, like our Golgi apparatus, or our nucleus, or our mitochondria. Let's take a quick look at prokaryotic organisms once again. Remember, these are cells that lack membrane-bound organelles. Take any bacteria, and that's an example of a prokaryotic organism. We call prokaryotic organisms pro, meaning pre, karyotic, kary meaning nucleus, so before nucleus, and this figure is going to show a generalized structure of a prokaryotic cell. All prokaryotes have a nucleoid with chromosomal DNA, but they don't have a nucleus. All prokaryotes have ribosomes, a cell membrane, and a cell wall. And then there's some other structures here that are present in some prokaryotic cells, but not all of them, such as the flagellum and the capsule and cilia or pili. So prokaryotic cells are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. And why in general are cells so small? We know that as a cell increases in size, its surface area to volume ratio decreases. When we have not enough surface area to support a cell's increasing volume, a cell is either going to have to divide or it's going to die. Because we have a decreased rate of chemical exchange when the surface area to volume ratio is low, this results in death of the cell because the processes that the cell needs to perform can't perform at the rate that they need to. Again, if the surface area to volume ratio is too small, meaning we have not enough surface area to support the volume of the cell, the cell is not going to be able to support all of the chemical functions it needs to do. Cells need to stay a certain size in order to support all of these functions, so we want a greater surface area to volume ratio wherever we can. We'll see this theme come up again and again in different cellular structures, different tissues, as well as organs. Humans, for example, have a brain that has a good example of surface area increase with all of its folds and gyri and sulci. In order to support larger cells, like eukaryotic cells, need some way to increase surface area for reactions, and one of the reasons organelles are so important is because they help with that increased surface area within the cell. So why are organelles important and why do we even have them? Again, there are four compartmentalizations. Each particular compartment within the cell has a specific function it needs to perform. It provides a favorable local environment for metabolic reactions. Certain metabolic reactions have very low or very high pHs compared to the rest of the environment of the cell, which means certain enzymes within those compartments wouldn't function if they were combined in the rest of the environment of the cell. In order for the enzymes and other proteins to do the jobs that they need to do, they need to be in the environment that works for them. So the compartments can lead us to that. Cells have these membranes that allow them to establish and maintain our internal environments that are different from the external environments. We minimize competing interactions and we increase surface area where reactions can occur. For example, along the cristae, the folds of the mitochondria. And again, it could also protect different parts of the cell from potentially damaging metabolic reactions when the pH or byproducts of reaction end up being dangerous for the rest of the cell. So how did we get organelles? The theory of endosymbiosis is one of the most popular ones for how membrane-bound organelles evolved once from free-living prokaryotic cells. So this idea that chloroplasts came from free cyanobacteria within an environment that eventually were engulfed through phagocytosis and adopted a symbiotic relationship with larger cells. Later on, these became parts of the cell that were synthesized as the cell replicated as well. But that engulfing and then that symbiotic relationship we think was the origin of certain organelles such as the chloroplast and the mitochondria. We have evidence for this due to the fact that many of these organelles have a double membrane, so our phospholipid bilayer, just like the one that surrounds the cell. 
And so based on their size and the membrane structure, it's very likely that these organelles once were their own type of cell. Mitochondria themselves have their own DNA, another hint that they were once prokaryotic cells themselves. They also support energetic processes, and these internal membranes help with compartmentalization and efficiency within that organelle. We have lots of other evidence for the unity of life, which we'll be talking about later this year, including how the cell membrane is similar from organelles to the actual cell, different cellular processes, like glycolysis that happen across all living things, and of course the universal genetic code. Feel free to go back and review anything in this video. Thanks for watching.